I'm here with Anna Locke, who is a former um, MP for Tuki Tuki. Kia ora, Anna, and thanks for joining me. Uh, kia ora, Andrew, and it's great to be with Hawke's Bay app. Yes, thank you. Now, Anna, um, not only are you a former uh, Tuki Tuki MP, but you're also a regional council ratepayer, and you've been quite um, involved in or giving your opinions quite a bit on the state of play at the moment with um, with the Hawke's Bay Regional Council's uh, three-year or long-term plan. Um, you've got some issues with the way things are being handled, and I think you were at a meeting last night, of a fruit growers meeting, where there was quite a bit of disquiet about, um, you know, we're looking at, a, what was it, 19.6% um, rates increase. What are your thoughts on, on that and the long-term plan as a whole? Well, Andrew, as a regional rate payer, I've always taken quite a strong interest in what the Regional Council does. And I really believe that the Regional Council is in a very strong and powerful position to make a real difference for Hawke's Bay during this time when rate payers are finding things so challenging. So I've, I've looked at, read through the consultation document and I guess my concerns originally come back to the decision that the council made to switch from capital, from land value to capital value. And they did this with over 90% of the 500 submissions that were against the switch. They ignored public opinion and decided to switch to capital values anyway. And what that's done is meant that for thousands of ratepayers, particularly those with homes, fixed incomes, pensioners, along with growers and those that have invested in their properties into their capital values, that they've really been hit twice by this annual plan. Um, for me, and our, uh, we, we live on a lifestyle block in Waipatu, and our rates are going up 75%. And that concerns me because we took the decision a few years back to relocate, help our mother, my mother, relocate onto our property. So she has a relocatable home that's next door to our house that um, has, of course, increased our capital value. But we don't get anything more from the regional council for for that for that at, at all. In fact, in these rates. Um, we're going to be paying $250 a year for um, this new regional public transport plan that's being, um, I don't know where it is, it actually is, no one can actually see what we're going to get for it, but I would need to drive um, to catch a bus. So mm -hmm. for people that are living in the rural areas, their contribution to the public transport fund seems to be a bit out of whack with those who would be able to use it. But, but look, I, yeah. The argument of the councillors who did vote in favour of the proposal was that actually it was a minority that did make submissions and there was a great silent majority. Do you buy that argument that there are a lot of people out there who are silently supporting the, the move by the council? No, not at all. I think that people are extremely busy in their own busy lives. Many people are just focusing on working hard to support their families. And I don't, first of all, think the council did a very good job in communicating what the impact of a capital rating switch would be on ratepayers. You'll know now that through this annual plan process, We've been given a tool that shows us how much our rates are going to increase under the capital values, but they never did that to show them what they would have been under land values. People just have no idea um, of how uh, big this impact was going to be. 
Um, I, I also heard at the meeting last night, Councillor Jock McIntosh, he said that the decision, that he made his decision in the end to switch to capital values based on his own personal experience and ability to be able to afford to pay more. I found this extraordinary because he had also listened to a retired pensioner give her submission around the rate switch where she told council that it was going to now be a matter of reducing her power and being colder or going without food if she was to be able to afford a rate rise. So I think there are certain circumstances of people being in very tough times. And while it might sound amicable, or, or well, not amicable, while it might sound admirable, actually, to um, say, well, look, I can afford to pay a higher rate rise, so rates should go up. That's a good, that, uh, to me, that's not a reason for a councillor to make a decision on behalf of the whole of the, the region. Because the way the council is going about this is that they say they need to reduce debt. So what they're doing is um, then they say they're trying to keep the rates to a minimum, um, the rates increases to minimum, but they're also cutting services. So they're looking at, um, the, uh, one option is uh, looking at not funding the Hawke's Bay tourism at all. There's cuts potentially to, Ma to, to Mata Park Trust. Are they going about this the right way, do you think? And where could they find those savings? I think they've looked at areas that they seem to think would be quick hits, but they're, they're wrong. We shouldn't be cutting subsidies to healthy homes, um, cutting maintenance to our regional parks, including the Parkify Dog Park. Mm. And uh, we certainly should keep those core basic facilities that ratepayers have invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in over the years to keep to keep them going. What they haven't done is given Hawke's Bay the opportunity to consider opening the war chest. Council has a $500 million investment fund Included in that is $100 million worth of profits from the sale of port shares, um, includes government bonds, it includes properties, 25 of them in Wellington, and a, an investment return portfolio that's been um, returning about 2 to 3% on average. They're now telling us that the best thing they to do with that is to put it in a more aggressive fund and so it will return more money um, for future generations. But I think they should have given ratepayers the choice. We should have been able to say, look, we should be able to take some of the war chest to pay down debt and prioritise flood protection. And they should have gone to the public and asked them. In fact, they don't actually have to... Um, they don't need to run a referendum or um, go out for more consultation. They can actually draw on those funds. So I find it extraordinary that they have not allowed ratepayers the opportunity to look at that. I don't think we should be spending that money on um, OPEX, but I certainly think where it comes to um, lowering debt and ensuring that we invest in infrastructure that, that should be considered for the long-term future and protection of all of Hawke's Bay. But to be fair to the council, they're not alone in these high rates, um, proposing these high rate increases. We've got Hastings District Council, which is sitting on 25%, and other councils, uh, councils in Hawke's Bay at similar, um, you know, similar figures as well. Um, isn't it just the nature of what we've been through as a region in terms of Cyclone Gabriel and that, that we are going to be having to pay for this? I think the Regional Council is in a different position because it has such a significant 
investment portfolio. Another thing that we don't see from the Regional Council is exactly how they are planning to spend the money. In fact, the one of the most concerning things about the rate increase is none of the money that they're wanting to raise this year is actually going into flood protection. Uh, it's at one area that I think needs to be addressed is that during COVID, they did a rate freeze. So we didn't have an increase in rates and now they have to pay back the debt on that um, borrowing. That's something that they certainly could address through the, through the war chest. That, that's just my opinion. Yeah, because they, they say they will say that um, actually um, raising stock banks and flood protection is an important part of their long term plan or their three year plan. And that um, you know, so so they are they saying they are focused on that. But what they've been given two hundred and three million dollars from the government towards that flood protection, and they need to raise forty seven million of that but they only in this plan they're asking us how that should be um, split between ratepayers whereas I think that they should be looking at the at the war chest and saying that everybody benefits from flood protection yeah. but the council doesn't have a plan for the flood protection work in fact they make a very chilling confession on page two of their consultation document, where they're still waiting for three reports to come through in June and July, where they're expecting huge um, cost burden on ratepayers in the future. And so they're operating blind in that space. The other thing that is conspicuous and it's absent Andrew, is that there's no mention in the annual plan of any type of operational structure review. And that came up at the grower meeting. And I think it's a fair question about why isn't the council looking at itself? And do we have a council that is fit for purpose to prioritise flood protection? And are there areas where that they haven't put forward that could be looked at from an operational structure review? Um, are you? Do you think they should be looking at, uh, for example, their personnel costs as well? Because there has been a significant increase in the number of, of employees they have. It would be irresponsible of the council not to. Yeah. But... I also think that they need to look at overheads and some of the other projects that they are focusing on. People talk to me a lot about um, land catchment and whether that should be having as much um, focus at the moment. There's a lot of concern about spending $7 million on public upgrading our public transport of buses. Yeah. over the next three years. I think it'll be a lot more than that to to make people want to use the buses. Yeah. They're big buses and Hawke's Bay just doesn't seem to have a have an appetite for, for, for big bus services. So I think something has to give in that in that area. If we hadn't had a cyclone, we may be in a different position. But yeah. everything has changed. Yeah. And I think the council, I really think the council can do something about this. They need to listen. I think they should reverse their capital switch. I think they should go back to the drawing board and put up a plan that can give the council confidence that here is a good pathway, that we're going forward and we'll see some results. Because... Based on what I've seen and the, the public meetings I've been to, it doesn't seem to know to me that the council really knows where it's going. And just uh, quickly looking at the issue of Hawke's Bay tourism, and you've been involved in marketing and tourism and that sort of thing in the past. Um, 
do you think uh, one of the proposals or the, the first proposal is to cut funding completely? The second proposal is for the other councils to pick up a share of um, funding Hawks Bay Tourism. Do you think these, uh, these two are the only options? What else would you suggest? Well, the council's been a bit disingenuous with its consultation because it hasn't included keeping the status quo. Yeah. And the reason that the regional council has the tourism uh, levy is it was a decision made by all the councils to use the regional council as the regional mechanism in which for people to make a contribution and through our rates towards promoting the whole of Hawke's Bay, and that money goes through to Tourism Hawke's Bay. So if, I, I believe we should keep the status quo. I am concerned that by um, returning back to councils funding it individually, we'll end up having the same issues that we've had before, and uh, where councils have been disjointed, councils have wanted to run their own um, marketing and campaigns where they focus on Napier or focus on Hastings, whereas I think it's all about bringing people to the region. And it goes well beyond tourism. Yeah. Uh, when we talk about tourism and promoting the region, we're talking about this being a great place to come and work and attract people to invest here. And I think that Hawke's Bay Tourism has a role to play. Sure, it can do better. Everyone can do better in what, how we are spending the money and where it's going and a bit more accountability. But, look, the regional council is basically collecting a rate on behalf of all the councils, and that, that's all their job is. So just uh, to sum up, um, do you think that... We saw people at this meeting last night. Do you think there is going to be a groundswell of people actually standing up now and, and, and not just uh, interest groups, but ratepayers from across the region. Do you think they'll stand up and make their views known? I think those who have managed to um, have the time to connect and make submissions will. We know 500 wasn't enough last time. I'm hoping that we at least double that, if not more. But another concerning thing that I think is happening with councils is we've seen two public meetings being called by groups. We've had a grower public meeting and we've had a tourism public meeting. And yet the council, and uh, all the councils, none of them are having public meeting. And the days of the good old town hall where councillors would come along and speak their views frankly and you could have a decent conversation and debate and read the read the room, These, that's not happening. And whether that's a sign of the times and whether that's because councillors feel that it's better to engage one-on-one, -on -one, I think we've lost a lot of the um, important part of being part of engagement in the, in the community. And look, I think this uh, story has a long way to go yet, and we will be um, following it and, and seeing where it, uh, what con conclusion it comes to. But thank you so much for your time and your views as well, and all the best for the future. Thanks, Andrew. Look forward to joining Hawke's Bay app again sometime. Excellent. Thank you.